Good evening and welcome into the Pacers Podcast Show. I'm Kyle Newman, your host. And I'm Red Hensley, your co-host. We have a great lineup for the next hour. We will discuss the Pacers' latest off-season news, talk about the rule changes that should occur and that might occur, chat about Indiana's marketing situation at Banker's Life, and answer the question, what is your most favorite Pacers team in franchise history and why? Rhett, 10th Pacers podcast show. We're in the double digits, ready to break out the cake? Yes, we are. Hey, that's a good idea. Cake sounds good right now, but nonetheless, we are a month and a half in. How are you doing tonight, buddy? This will be a good one. Oh, I'm great. I'm great. How are you doing? That's great. Hey, like you like to say, I'm doing just peachy. Great, great. Absolutely. Well, let's get into it, Red. I know that you've, you've got a lot of good stuff for this one. I've got some good stuff. Let's we're gonna we're gonna just talk good stuff. Our oh, only yeah. two cents. So so let's get into it then. Latest off season news. One thing that we know is for sure. Roy Hibbert might be out. His new i the new Pacers new identity that they are looking for is really leaning toward getting the big fella out of Indiana, and we talked about it a little last week. Larry Bird, Frank Vogel, they both have expressed their thoughts on his performance this past year, and it was not a good one, to say the least. So you kind of get the sense, Rhett. What do you think? Well, you know, hopefully he's gone. Um, <laughs> from what I've seen, just put it. You know, I, yeah, I, he fifteen million dollars. I don't see him turning down, but he has expressed interest in leaving during the regular season. So you know, he might take that pay cut. I mean, he's he's made a pretty penny um, from the Indiana Pacers, so it could really go either way. It really could. It will be interesting. We've talked about, well, how will Roy Hibbert look at the situation with the money? Is he going to weigh, you know, how much would he get offered? Here's the thing. It's highly unlikely that any other team would offer him $15 million. Highly unlikely anybody would pay him more than $10 million. No doubt. So you look at that, and it and it is kind of kind of hard to imagine him leaving even though I think a lot of fans and people within the organization even might want to see change there but at the same time in his mind would he accept less if he's happier somewhere else would it it's just interesting I mean what do you think well you know from what I've read and stuff like that I've seen the offers that he would more than likely get would not even be half of the salary that he's making right now. So it would basically be cut in half. Maybe he would get a little bit more if a team really wanted him, which the Portland Trailblazers have shown interest. And, you know, even if the Indiana Pacers sign him, they could ship him out. So really, he's if he signs back, then great. We can send him on his way. And if he doesn't, then $15 million that opens up for the Indiana Pacers that they have potential to sign, like, you know, Marcus Aldridge, which there has been rumors that he wants to be back in Dallas in his hometown. You ma- you mentioned LaMarcus Aldridge. He's number three right now as far as the top free agents out there goes. Yeah. So that is a big name, and I agree. Can you imagine what Indiana could do with 15 more million dollars with the yeah. free agents that are out there? I'll remind you, some of these free agents, obviously, okay, LeBron James, well, that's not going to happen. Marcus <laughs> All, we said LaMarcus Aldridge, Kawhi Leonard, Kevin Love, Jimmy Butler, DeAndre Jordan, Tim Duncan. Draymond Green, the list goes on and on. There are a ton of good players out there. Red, I know that you really like Draymond Green, 
He yeah. is only making nine hundred and fifteen thousand dollars right now. Holy crap! That is that is incredible, especially for his play. Um, you know, the Warriors have said that they will match basically anything that somebody throws out there. But if the Indiana Pacers did offer enough, that is hitting the small market that they are wanting. So that is a that could that's definitely something that needs to be on um, Larry Bird's mind right now. I agree. You know what else is on his mind and the organization is re-signing free agents Rodney Stuckey and Luis Scola this summer. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, you know, I, I like the Rodney Stuckey idea. Um, Luis Scola, it could go either way. Um, I think signing him for the right price, he's a hard-working uh, player. That, he's I mean, effective he just goes, off the bench. He, he goes in and puts in what he's supposed to do. And basically you can see that almost every game. So that is good, but he is getting older. I believe he's going to be 36 next year. Um, you know, maybe it's time to move on. If I, if he can, if we can get him for a a great price, I think that he should stay. But to be honest, I want I want if we're going to go small, let's go small and get people that can run the court, just like Draymond, Draymond Green. Hey, I agree with that, and and I think Rodney Stuckey had a solid year. I like that Bird's interested in re-signing him. Luis Scola really is a solid big man off the bench, and he's proven to be. Even as he's getting older, he still is smooth with the basketball and very productive. So the Pacers, for the right price, and I think they would keep him for the right price, would yeah. would have a good he, asset. He has. He has expressed that he does. He doesn't care about the money. He enjoys it at the Indiana Pacers. So, from what I've heard so far, he is a he is a great. Um, it, it's highly likely that the Indiana Pacers will have him back next year. From what he has said, it's great seeing that a player that expresses how he how much he loves the franchise. So. I think that even helps with chemistry, so it's great there. I agree. I agree, and, you know, it's interesting. Let's look at it like this. So we talked a little bit about the draft in last week's show. If the Pacers draft a big man, which we expect that they will, in the first round at least, then think about – the options that are available for Indiana in this free agency market after the draft. What do, what do you think about that? Let's say they get a big man in the draft. Do you well, still think that the Pacers should go after a big man in free agency even with the possibility of Roy Hibbert staying? Yeah, I mean, because I, I have said that Roy Hibbert, if we sign him, I believe that they will end up trading him before the season ends. Um, you know, I have my top three list of um, big men that we should draft. And, you know, Trey Lyles is my number one. That's and, interesting. I've been reading a little bit about him being on the Pacers' radar. Talk yeah. About, talk about that. He's my number one. And, you know, that's in the territory. This is from, like, the people that I believe that the Pacers could end up drafting um, that since, you know, they are 11th pick more than likely um, just, like, based on, you know, who's out there in that range. So it would be like you liked last week. Um, He has great footwork, but I still have doubts if he could, you know, transition into into the NBA role. Which you no, know, he he has potential, but I think he could fit, he would fit in pretty well. Maybe be like a Luis Scola or something like that. But Frank Kaminsky, and then Miles Turner. Miles Turner doesn't have great footwork, but he is a def- or he is a rebounding machine. So you know, footwork can be worked on. Look how bad Roy Hibbert's footwork was, and when how he bad got, at rebounding he is. Well, he still is that, but his he had awful footwork when he came to the Pacers uh, when he 
you know, when he got drafted. And he, if he got the ball, he was more than likely going to travel down low <laughs> in the post. Very true. And they worked him up. They had him great at one time. But, you know, I think that he could be, could be taught post moves, great footwork. So we could, we could end up seeing a uh, Miles Turner in the, for an Indiana Pacers jersey. It would be interesting. I already told you that I think it's Frank Kaminsky. That's my number one for the Pacers in that yeah. position. But well, regardless, you can't go wrong with any of those big men. The point, the bottom line is we both believe that it will be a big man in the first round, and we both believe that it needs to be a big man, right? Yes, Okay. that is true. So we're on the same page with that. Now, second round. Um, unless somebody falls back, that's a point guard, and that is just outstanding. So, But other than that, big men. Right, and it's highly unlikely that that would happen. So yeah. if – and if it doesn't, and and that's still that's win win scenario for the Pacers because then you look at the second round, and in the second round there are so many guards around the Indiana Pacers pick, the around the forty first pick or so, it that forty one to forty five range it's just loaded with guards and the Pacers could end up getting a big man in the first round. A guard in the second round, and then Kyle. have the free agency to explore. What do you think about that? I think they get a guard in the second round if they get a big man in the first. Yeah, I, I do believe that they will get a guard in the second round. But I would like to throw something out at you right now. Throw it out. I don't know if I don't Hit know if you know it. this, but I just thought of this. What if the Indiana Pacers? Um, not sure if they could actually sign Roy Hibbert back that quick, but if they traded him for a first round draft pick, um, not you know not deep. Not up close, but, you know, later in the draft to get a first-round draft pick. It would be interesting. Do you think that is possible? Hey, anything is possible. Well, it's not true if they if they can't sign him back. Anything <laughs> is possible, Rhett. <laughs> but the biggest thing for me is if these draft scenarios play out like this, I think that... Indiana has to go get a big time free agent player to help this team yeah. not take a step back into rebuilding mode a little bit, but to keep striving and being a dominant force in the East to get back to that Indiana Pacers identity. They need to get a, a big time free agent and you, you know, it's kind of in Roy Hibbert's hands here, obviously, because he has that choice. You know, does he want to come back or not? But even if he does, the Pacers will still have some money, so they can still make something happen. We yeah, mentioned some of these names on this free agency list that are not getting paid a whole lot of money. I mean, even you go down past Draymond Green, Brooke Lopez, he's getting paid a lot. But maybe he would be one for less. He's getting paid Roy Hibbert numbers, fifteen million, which yes, and that is actually one of the trade scenarios that I did see for Brook Lopez, um, the swap of Roy Hibbert for Brook Lopez, oh. and you know, that would be an interesting trade because um, Brook Lopez he can he can play. Yes, yes, he can, and and even some other big name players, Paul Millsap from the Hawks, only making nine and a half million. Greg Monroe, five and a half million. Al Jefferson is making thirteen and a half, but he's getting older, so maybe, maybe his his money would would go down a little bit. But regardless, you just you look at all these players in the top twenty like that that are not making as much as Roy Hibbert, that are so much more productive than him. Yes. The Pacers uh, have a lot of leeway. I expect it, Bird to make something happen. $15 million is a lot of money. And, you know, there's big name players. Kevin Love's making that much. And he is one of the, um, he is, he's going to be on the free agent list. I think he's restricted, I believe. Or no, he has a player option. So, you know, like, Roy like I said, like I said, he could, he could, he could opt out. And I don't think I he will, 
Hey, he hey, could. hey, like you just said, anything, anything is possible. possible. Anything is possible. So it is. I wouldn't mind seeing him in a uh, Pacers uniform next year, but who knows if it will happen. Let me throw this at you, Kyle. So hit me with your best shot. Yeah, don't do that. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So the widow of the Pacers uh, former owner sues the IRS for $21 million um, for saying that the team became an embarrassment. She is suing $21 million because they were an embarrassment in 2004 during the during the brawl. She lost they lost $11 million due to suspensions and um and due to you know player fights and stuff like that she got that year she got charged 18 million dollars um through the tax IRS and total with interest she got charged 21 million dollars um you know 21 and a half right around there and Bryn paid that in 2014 so let's just say that she is suing the IRS for $21 million, most likely not going to get it. Have you ever heard of somebody suing somebody for an for embarrassment? No, it's this lady a coop. She have a ton of money? Well, or she's what? That's that is just, crazy. You just want to just waste some money for something? It sounds like a sounds like she has got a grudge with somebody. In the organization, this is payback or something statement. Yeah, that is – well, it's it's Herb's uh, – Simmons' wife, Bryn, and Herb died, and let me just read this. Unfortunately for Mel, he didn't have the right to sell the Indiana Pacers. Uh, he could only make a transfer of his interest to his son, David Simmons, and only with Herbert's consent. In December 2013, Bryn received a notice of deficiency from the Internal Revenue Service – the amount due of eighteen million six hundred and seventy five thousand. Together with interest, the amount totaled twenty one thousand I mean twenty one million three hundred and seventy two thousand. When now that that's just crazy. I don't I, first of all, that's a lot in taxes. But they ended up having she had to which is one of the reasons why she's she's suing is because she had to take some of her own money just to keep the the Indiana Pacers afloat um, in 2000, I believe, five. So she had to pull her own money to keep the Indiana Pacers going that next year. Don't you think that's crazy? I do think that's crazy. It's a it's a big ordeal, and it's a confusing one. It is. It is. Sounds like it's making some headlines, and that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, cuckoo. I'll say. Nice, nicely done to bring something like that to the table. Breaking news here from Rhett Hensley. Oh, yeah. It was definitely an interesting one. It caught my attention. Hey, that's good. That's good. Anything that catches our attention, it's worth mentioning on this show, <laughs> especially when it relates to the Pacers. Oh, so yeah. that let's transition then, Rhett, into this next segment and talk about the rule changes – that should occur, and that might occur. There's been a lot of talk about one particular rule. I think this one's the one that drives me insane. And, you know, this will be fun here because I I have an interesting take on this. But Adam Silver, the current commissioner of the NBA, is going to discuss getting rid of the hack-a-shack rule. Stupid, this summer. stupid, stupid, stupid. So basically, if 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 anyone that's listening does not know what this rule currently is, basically it's a strategy that started back with Shaquille O'Neal because he was known for being a poor free throw shooter, meaning under fifty percent, and so teams would foul him purposely at the at certain times in the game, particularly at the end of the game, assuming he'll miss one of two free throws, and it would play out in most teams' favor because they would be able to get back into the game. And all yeah. you have to do is grab him. So so it's been growing over the years into 
this rule really helping teams use they teams use this as a strategy coaches have gone on record and have said this and players it's it's no it's no mystery and and it becomes whoever is about is a poor free throw shooter shooter hacka howard hacka monroe whoever it is they're hacking them because they can't make the free throws and now S- silver is considering changing this Rhett, what do you think about this oh boy so let let me just throw this at you so let's say it's getting down to the end of the game um let's say let's say Paul George, let's just say he's not a good free throw shooter, which he is. He's a good free throw shooter. Right. But hypothetically, why not? Yeah. So, or actually, my bad. Let's say he's not a good shooter in general. So, what? So this is basically saying that if they have the ball, let's say they have to leave him open. That's basically how I feel like this rule is. If it's kind of connecting in. So they won't let him pass it to anybody else, only Paul George, because he's, you know, he's, they're protecting him from not being able to hit the shot. So I feel like that, that kind of confused me. But in, in reality, free throws, that's going to make people not want to, like, practice free throws. In basketball, that is one of the big things. That's a fundamental and that is something that that is something that has to be done. You have to practice that. That's like not shooting. A, it's like not taking a jump shot, not working on your layups. Exactly. That is something that has to be in the game. Well, here's and what if you bothers me. If you can't hack somebody, then then what's the point? Here's what bothers me about this: Is it not any different than all the other strategies that one has to win a game? Yeah, I mean it's part of the game. If you can't make your free throws, that's not the other team's fault. But they're yeah. trying to win the game. No kidding. You shouldn't have signed Howard. Even even last night, I was watching the the Mavericks and the Rockets game, and when it got in the third quarter, they started fouling him. Or I mean, started fouling Howard because they knew that he couldn't hit, and most of those free throws he missed. So that was their strategy. They even started that in the the first half. So. They played that smart. That's a strategy that people will use, they, and they, they can't. That's not the other team's fault because that person can't hit a free throw. Exactly. It's called go to the gym, stay a little later, and work on your free throws, and you won't have that problem. Exactly, and that's right. And you know what? I don't know if may, maybe maybe he's getting pressure from fans. There's maybe there's been a lot of comments about how they they they're tired of seeing it happen at the end. I, I'm not sure. I think it would be a mistake by Adam Silver, who I think Red has done a great job since he's yeah, taken over. As I like him way better than David Stern. But he is. Adam the, but this is a would good be one. something that I think would be a mistake. And, and let's just give a little more background on it and why it's come up. This strategy, and and I do believe what I've been reading is it's it, it's it's something that is not popular among NBA fans. The actual fans do not like to see it. So I do think there's that pressure, and I'm surprised because I'm not one of them. I like yeah, to see either. it. I think it's part of the game. Now, if you can't free throw, then it's your problem. Exactly. Now, here's what's happened. San Antonio and and their coach, Greg Popovich, is really who's drawn this uh, this to the commissioner's attention because throughout the playoffs here – he has been persistently fouling the Clippers' big man, DeAndre Jordan, who is a terrible free throw shooter, one of the worst in the NBA, low 40s. And here is what Commissioner Adam Silver told ESPN in how he will examine ways this summer to dissuade teams from using this tactic. He said, it's something that I'm on the fence about. My thought used to be that we should definitely change the rule. And then having sat through several general managers' meetings – competition meetings and having heard from some of the game's very best the view is the players should hit their free throws that changed my view a little bit having said that when i watch some of these games on television frankly it's not great entertainment for our fans and that's important as well what i've said is we have another general managers meeting coming up in may we have a competition committee meeting in june and i'm sure it's going to be a hot topic of discussion 
Then we have an owners' meeting in July. So I think at all three of those meetings, we're going to be having full-throated conversations about what the rules, the right rules, should be going forward. Rhett, I think it's comical when they can't hit it. I mean, Dwight Howard goes to the line and misses it. He he changes his form every time to try and hit it, and he misses it every time. I think it's funny, I to do. be honest. And if you that's that's like that's like. You know, not being able to hit your layup, it, you, that's like penalizing the other team for that person not hitting a layup, I feel like. so. Now, here's, here's, here's Popovich's take on the hack-a-shack rule. Interesting, because he uses it. He says, though, I hate it. I think it's awful. I hate doing it. Seriously. I think it's a pain in the neck. Fans don't like it. I don't like it. Nobody likes it. It disrupts the flow of the game. If there's an equitable way to get rid of it, I'm all for it. But it's part of the game. It's part of the rules now, and if you think somebody can't shoot a free throw, you might as well take advantage of it. If you think somebody can't shoot, you don't guard him the same way. So, the strategy's fair, it's just kind of ugly, I think. Now, I'm not going to disagree with that. I mean, I can see how fans would be turned off by it, except... If you're a fan of the team that's watching their uh, the opposing team miss free throws and you win the game, so yeah, what I understand. Would you, what would you I care? Think it, I think it's just sour grapes from the teams that have bad free throw shooters on their team, like the Houston Rockets or the Clippers. You know, it's you got to have free throw. It, it, it really just ticks me off. I see it one way and one way only. It's called just stay in the gym and knock down free throws. Get used to it. It's in the game. That's how that's how it's always been. No need to change something that is that is not broken. So I think it's a it'd be a stupid rule change and it'd make me frustrated with Adam Silver even though he could care less. But <laughs> you know, okay. it it's something that I think that does not need to be changed. Hey, I understand that, and, and I agree with that. It's part of the game. It's like somebody. It's like guarding somebody that can't go can't go left, and them saying that you can't make him go right. I mean, <laughs> exactly. It's it's just it's just part of it. It's just how it happens. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with this going forward. Hopefully, the right decision is made. Maybe maybe it's tweaked a certain way. You know, I think maybe fans hate how, okay, they get the rebound on the end and they foul them and the game stopped from early in the shot clock because they fouled them. All right, so maybe if they change it up, like, all right, so you have to cross cross half court and they have to be in the paint or something. You can tweak it to where the rule stays, but you don't do it immediately. And I can understand that because it drags the game on at the end and fine. But at the same time... Uh, it's part of the game, so you, they're they're smart people. They can figure it's like, it out. It's like in baseball, how it takes like five minutes just for him to throw a pitch. I mean, it's part of the game. You have to wait. It slows down it, but it's part of the game. Exactly. You gotta you gotta deal with it. So you have to deal with I'm it. I'm sorry, fans, if you don't like that, we'll suck it up. <laughs> you know, exactly. don't, don't go to the game. Don't watch it. But it's part of the game. Right. Exactly. And and I don't want to hear it when your team's winning. Yeah. Don't be complaining. So yeah. so it's just interesting, but we'll see what happens there. But let's talk about some other rules in the NBA that could end up changing. And, and quite frankly, I want to see what you think about some of these, Rhett, because some of them really bother me. I think that they're horrible rules, and and I think if they were solved, they would solve some of the problems that fans don't like. Now, the, part of it being rules, kind of just policies with the NBA in general. What do you think about this? A lot. I've heard. I've been reading a lot about this. Do you think that the NBA regular season games are too long? Hell no. They get paid millions of dollars. Suck it up. You know how many how many games do baseball players play? I mean, twice as many. One hundred and sixty-two. Yeah, and they might say that's not as physical, but you sit. You can sit there and watch the the, the pitcher throw tons of pitches, and you know messes up his arm. And whatnot. Well, you know, it's part of the game. That's why you get paid millions of dollars for it, and you picked that sport to go into to make that type of money. So, eighty-two games? No, I do not think that's. 
I think that's just right. You know, I I think if they want it lowered, I I mean I'll be all for it. Just drop their money, but millions of dollars down. Well, it would be interesting. I don't think the the regular season games are too long. I think those are fine. Knock How- out the preseason. Yeah, preseason. That's I'm I'm okay with knocking the preseason out. I don't like the preseason. I'm not a fan of the preseason in the NFL. I would like to see the preseason knocked out. I'm not a fan of spring training in baseball. They already have the longest the longest season out of any professional sport. So I think that it would be interesting if they cut maybe that out. But I think the regular season, maybe, 82 games, is fine. I think maybe one game just to like get back in the groove, um, have it flowing. You know, just one regular season game. Maybe play like, maybe play like your, just somebody in your division, just to get that that the juices flowing. Just cut out most of them. Just have one. Cut game. them all out. That's what I. Think. I'm all for that too, but you know, Here's if they if they if they need regular season games, and I think one would be acceptable, just like the NFL, just one. Well, there you go. That's what Red thinks. How about the NBA games in general? I've seen some things about the that the games are too long. People are get, oh people gosh. get irritated, or or not even too long. Well, this will be something separate. What do you think about the games length in general? Forty eight well, minute games. Well, again, if I pay a hundred dollars to go to a game, and I'm only there for an hour and a half, I'm going to be kind of frustrated. But you know. 48 minutes, LeBron James even said that it's not the time that, that makes the difference. It's how many games, which he needs to suck it up. But dropping it down to 40 minutes, that's not that's not going to do nothing. That's, when they're that's, out there that's playing. That's college level. That's That would be a two-hour game. Yeah. It's about so, two and a half right now if there's no overtime, but some of these things that are happening at the end of the games are extending it even longer than that. But let's face it, NF, the football games are three hours minimum. Yeah. Baseball games are three hours minimum. Hockey games are as long as NBA games. So, you know, even closer to football games at times. So, so I agree with you. I don't think this. Yeah. These a lot of people think this is a problem and should be changed. Cry me a river. Exactly. I agree with that. Now, this is interesting. Do you think that there are games that start too late? Yes. Because I have read a lot of things that people are tired of seeing games start at 10.30 Eastern time and not get yes. over until 1 in the morning. I can't stay up that late. <laughs> okay, so there's oh, a little my. bit of an understanding there, there that maybe time, days, that, that all games don't have to be after people get off of work at night. Yeah. It could be... At different times during the day during the regular season. I mean, not like during, like not at like one o'clock. I don't, I don't think that. But like maybe four o'clock, five o'clock, right in that area when people are supposed to get off work, they could get off a little early and go to the game. But going ten ten thirty at night, games sometimes not getting over till one o'clock in the morning. Now, see, or the problem it, with that is though is that you, you have to account for obviously those later games are West Coast Conference games. So if yeah. you if you start the games those games at like four, that's going to be one o'clock out on the West Coast, right? Yeah, well, I'm talking about starting at in the West Coast at four o'clock, so it'd be about seven. Oh, well, yeah, so, so seven it'd be o'clock. about seven. Yeah, and I agree with that. Make the games. And to do that, what you have to end up doing is not having the 8 and 10.30 start games televised. You're going to have to have two 8 o'clock games televised on two different channels to make yeah, which this happen. Yeah, which I mean, and that's okay. And I, don't, and I don't disagree with that. I agree. I think the games start a little too late. Uh, I'd be all right with a 9.30 starting time. Right, and, and I wouldn't disagree with that. And it would be interesting. I wonder if... The games will ever switch to at a different starting times, not just in the evening when people get off of work. Because, like baseball, baseball now yeah. they have twice as long of a season, but they'll have games randomly on a weekday during the day, and yeah. and that would be kind of interesting. I've never ex- been able to experience that in a sport 
other than baseball. But to me, thinking of that idea is kind of cool. Like, hey, I want to take a break for work today. Let's go see a game at the start of the day. That would be pretty cool. I mean, it would be something different. So that's kind of interesting. But I guess we'll see with that. But we sound on the same page with that. Now, what do you think about this? The block slash charge rule is too vague and leads to too much flopping. What do you think about that rule right now? There's a lot of inconsistency with it. I think it's kind of hard to determine, like, a change for that. Um, you know, there is a lot of flopping going on. But, you know, you know, being a, being a big Reggie fan, I, I love it. I like I don't mind the flopping. You know, we had Lance Stevenson. He was a big flopper. I liked it. Not going to lie. Not going to lie here. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's acting. They're entertainers. They, they, they go out there. They want to flop. I think, you know, I if they want to get fined, I mean. But, you know, no, there could you know be what? a few. I disagree with you. That is easy to say when it is Lance Stevenson on our Pacers team. But you know darn well when you see another player on the other team do that and we get called for the foul, you're pissed about it. And oh, that, I, I I do exactly. get pissed about it, but I, I think it's part of the game. It's not part of the game. It The rule it is. is the rule. And if you're going to – that's basically cheating is what it is. Uh, and that it, is not called for in the game. And that will turn fans off. So I agree – that flopping needs oh. to, you know what, they're going to get fined, so, and that's fine, but the rule is set, so the referees need to pay closer attention to the rule, and it's pretty obvious when somebody is flopping or not. That is not part of so the have, game, have, I don't like have, it. So have you never said during, when we sat and watched Reggie videos, that, wow, that is just, that is great. Sure, it's comical, when, but again, yeah, that's because we're... Reggie you like it. Fans. You like it. So I you, you like are, him. but you you liked how he he flopped. I, I thought mean, it was entertaining, but that's because it you was liked for it. my team. You like, but I mean, but you you can't just you know have, I mean, apples and oranges it's here. It's still not you, good. I wouldn't condone it. I wouldn't. Condone oh, I would. It. I know you would because you're. I would condone like Lance that. Stevenson blowing in his ear again. I wouldn't. Con- I mean, I, I would not but, condone that. Because oh, then my. it's going to happen with other players, and it's going to be against my team. And it's the same with it's the same with dirty plays. I wouldn't condone that either. Reggie did a lot of that. Yeah, it was entertaining, but I think that that's not part of the game. I don't. Oh, like it's, it. it it adds to the game. I like it. I mean, it's kind of like hockey. How they get getting big brawls. I mean, come on, it's it's great for the game. It adds intensity. Everybody's just going at it when that. I mean. It makes them actually it lights a fire under their butt because I believe that a lot of the NBA players they don't put all their heart into the game, and once that happens, like a little scuffle breaks out or something like that, that puts a fire under their butt and they're out there playing hard. That's how I see it. And if they want to do some flopping, it I mean, if they're if the refs can't catch them, then I mean, do you expect the refs to catch every single thing? No, but I expect I them. But. But how right do you call. how do you expect them? I would like to see you out there they have re- making. That's I would what like they have replays. They for. don't. We don't need to break out the replay replay for a flopping. I mean, come on. Why not? If they want to get involved. if they want to if they want to get fined at the end of the season. I mean, after the game, after they review it, then not change the not change the play during it. But they can fine them. I don't care. They review. I mean, they they more than likely don't care. They review. Well, how about this? They review, they review calls, flagrant calls, technical calls, right? So yeah. So why can't they review a flopping call? They're both, you know, it's rules. Because so, more than likely, you can't, you you can't like say, oh, is he flopping? I mean, you would have to do that for basically every charge. Oh come on! Oh come you on! Can, they're you, three feet away from them. You can no. tell. Oh, oh it, gosh! All right, so I'm a certified ref here, so. When oh. I when I was refing, break out break out the ID. When you are when you are in that like in the in the zone, you you miss things. I mean that's what happens as a ref. It's it's going fast. I mean, I, I mean I've had my friend on a team. He flopped so hard, but it was so funny, and he he got the ref to believe it. That kid got thrown out of the game. It it was great. It was hilarious. 
And if if you want to trick the refs, then go right ahead. I mean, if you are good enough to go around that, then kudos for you. Come on, please. You know what? Different segment for a different show, but this it will be great. It'll lead for a debate show is what it'll be. We'll just get these different topics, and, and Rhett and I will go at it and debate it. That, oh, yeah. That That's how it will go. That That's great, though. That's where you stand with it. Let's just – one more before we move on to the next segment. This is something that's come up that could change, interestingly enough. The NBA wants to put ads on jerseys. What do you think about this? Another way for more money to be made. Stupid. That's just stupid. So, I don't. So you, you know, picture Paul George with his jersey on and then right in the corner, a little State Farm. I'm loving it. <laughs> yeah, on the back. I mean, come on. Yeah, that that I find very dumb. Um, they're already making enough money, and you know, I mean, if if they did do that, then I would be all for them putting more games on TV, you know, because they are making more money. So, you know, I would I would like to see that. It is well, probably wouldn't happen, but exactly. And and there there's already plenty of endorsements and advertisements, and the athletes are involved within the NBA. Come on now, yeah, that's go. just overboard. Don't don't diminish. <laughs> don't take away from the beautiful jerseys that yeah, we get okay. to look at for crying out loud. I mean, there I mean, was a that, little. There would was that little... be on the jerseys when you buy it from from the gift shop? I would hope not. Exactly. I sure as heck wouldn't want that crap on my jersey. Exactly. You see, I don't want to support McDonald's. There you go. I mean, I don't even know why the NBA would want to support McDonald's. Yeah, support Taco Bell. Think outside yeah. the bun. Well, the <laughs> thing is, is they've made some jokes about it. Like, that shot was sweet. Almost as sweet as Cozy Shack gluten-free, lactose-free <laughs> rice pudding. Available at Walgreens. I mean, so you can get you can get jokes out of these things, but come that on. That was hilarious. Advertisement on jerseys, No. I find no, it thanks. Very no thanks. No yeah. thanks. So interesting, right? Interesting how that is. Okay, well let's we'll, we'll see about the rules that may change, that we think will change, and maybe for a different show as we debate some things. That'll be fun. But hey, let's move on to Indiana's marketing situation at Banker's Life. Rhett, let's talk about it a little bit. What are the games like? We've been to plenty. What do you think? Entertainment promotions that they have. Where does it rank in the NBA? What do you think? What let's start with how many games we've been to? Well, I mean, we've been I would say over a hundred games. Or yes. right around there. You I know, agree. It is something that we enjoy going to. We've always enjoyed going to them. And, you know, we we know our fair share of them, so we have a pretty good perspective on this. Um, I would like to see the Indiana Pacers change a few things, um, especially with the. I don't think they toss T-shirts out enough, to be honest. I don't disagree I don't think, with that. I don't think they do. In fact, I think that they're starting to toss T-shirts less. No kidding. They should do and it this twi- is, twice. This is this is a thing that me me and you went to Detroit uh, for the Pistons and Pacers game. It's one of my things. I would love to go to all the NBA arenas, but we've been to the, the Pistons. List. Yeah, yeah, there you go. But we went to the Pistons game, and for every three that they made, they would toss T-shirts out. That gets the crowd entertained. That, that like, I believe, lightens the – it makes the experience even better and puts the crowd into it because then they start getting rowdy. And then, you know, I, I think it's more interesting. So I think that would that gives the fan more of a fan experience, I and it's even more branding once they once they're wearing the t-shirt. So there you go, put Clinico on it or something. <laughs> I I agree. Hey, <laughs> if they want their advertisement, there you go. <laughs> there you go. There's Red Solution. That's funny, but I don't know. It's interesting. You think about. Okay, so fans, you want to go to games and you want to have – you pay a lot of money most of the time for the tickets for an average game and you want to get that full experience, especially if your team is losing that game or if they're I'm getting kidding. blown out. How do you keep those fans there and, and, and not be pissed that they just paid $70 for a ticket 
and you get no blown kidding. out of the water. So you have to think about that. And I agree. Okay, T-shirts are great things. We've talked about this. The Pacers only seem to do T-shirt contests like that. T-shirts, either t-shirt contests toss. or the they'll shoot them off, give them off. In the fourth quarter, used to be at least twice in a game. Now it seems they're only doing it in the fourth. Yeah, I mean, it's only in the fourth. I've been to quite a few this year, and I've only seen them in the fourth quarter. And what? I mean, for the poor people in the balcony, you only get two T-shirts. Exactly. Goodness gracious. And no, that's another solution. Start bringing more of the employees up to the cheerleaders. The Make them do something. Bring them to the entrances and throw T-shirts out to. to I remember when they hand. did that for a while. They they did that, and I used to snag them right out of your hand. It's great. Hey, about that, and I told you I'd mention it. I am on a two, a two game snagging spree from snagging them from you, Rhett. And you're about yeah. half a foot taller than me. But yes, you got the muscle yes, on. Yes, everybody, so. I bullied my way. To snag it beautifully. Yeah, out he, of he said it. Arm. He said it. He bullied me. I almost I knocked feel him over bad. two levels of chairs. Yeah. It was beautiful. How rude. Yes, I, I was tired of not getting those t shirts when they would come up there every once in a blue moon. Yeah. But it, I, it wasn't just me that thought he was psycho, it was everybody around him. Oh, uh, yeah, he's got jokes, but the real thing is. <laughs> The T-shirts are a fan favorite. They like that. Other promotions. Okay. Sec- at the Pacers games, they'll do the little section. The, the They'll do the power. Uh, they'll do the lottery ball around for the section, and the winner gets a lottery ticket. Deal or no deal. Yeah. So they, they, they're trying to do these different things. At halftime, there's usually some performance. I think that rarely the Pacers get, get a good halftime show. I think that's something they could improve on, yeah. Uh, uh, especially compared to some other teams of what they do. But so maybe they could improve halftime things. But you know, give away fru- food. How about more food giveaways? They have game night specials, which don't even get me started with that. Every game I go to, it's a hundred dollar freaking jerseys. basketball or something. It's a hundred dollar jerseys marked down to seventy five, or it's a free little mini Pacers basketball. I want hey, twenty five dollar off is a good actually. The last Pacers game I went to, it was half price Pacers jerseys. Oh my goodness, what a deal! That is the best Pacers special I have seen. Hey, we love good deals, but every time I always walk around, I consider the game night special, and then I don't end up getting it because it's not so good. You're cheap. You know, you had to go there. If you put it bluntly, fine. Yes. I'm frugal, but I like to consider my options. You're so options. cheap, you, your butt squeaks when you walk. Come on. Uh, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> he, he's got a point, but again, these are things that, from a marketing standpoint, you, they, can, they try and think about at games, and as fans, we have these ideas for the market. What would be more inter- – what would add for more entertainment there? And the Pacers – rarely do t-shirt out in fact they only do a gold out when it comes to the playoffs let's talk about the gold out they only do t-shirts for every section and maybe this is what would add more entertainment for regular season games because some teams do do them during the regular season but they only do section outs during the playoffs and for the pacers it's always gold and it's usually the same type of a shirt with the same similar design. Rhett, I'm kind of tired of it. What do you think about it? Mix it up. Do checkered or something like that. Do a, I mean, do blue collar gold it's swagger. It's not just one color for the team. <laughs> or, I mean, do every other or something. Just mix it up. I think every other would be sick. But I, I do too. I'm sick of, t- of tired and seeing. I can't tell you how many gold playoff jerseys. I, I, I had to give away. Oh, I, I mean, because they didn't fit me. I was starting to give them away. Because he's I too had, skinny, folks. I had 13 um, gold collar blue swagger T-shirts that I gave away that I got from the playoffs. 13 I had collected up. 
and now I even found more. So, wow. oh my goodness, that is insane. That is insane. You know what? That That is – I can relate to it because I've had to get rid of some too. Time to switch it up. They have they have another color, color called blue in their yeah. team colors. How about a blue out? How about do what some awesome other teams do like the Thunder where you get a, every other section's a blue and a white out? Yeah, blue and gold. Come on. I mean – Mix it up. Not to mention though they really do – Teams like the Thunder and the Warriors, some of their it's t-shirt amazing. outs, it's incredible. Everyone participates. Now, I don't see that everybody participates with the Indiana Pacers. That is something that really drives me insane when people don't put on their freaking t-shirt. Yes. It is. That, that is something that you have to do. You do. I mean, come on. I agree with that. I think that it's that it's ridiculous and and – and maybe, quite frankly, maybe it's why the Pacers organizations decided. You know what? Maybe, maybe we shouldn't be doing it as often because they don't put them on, and we spend money to to get them. So, I don't, I don't know, but I think they need to switch it up. Get some blue and gold going. Get some just blue at, in some games. Switch it up. Go to some some throwback shirts. I mean. Oh, it'd be great. I think that would add to some good things, and then as far get as some Flojo T-shirts out there. That's mm-hmm. right. Get the Flojos or something. But other teams we mentioned do it well. The Warriors, and do you not? The Warriors, the Thunder, and do you not think? I mean, there's a reason that they are recognized as the top teams as far as home court advantages goes. Do you think that the fans? That, that maybe it has to do with a That's little Monty bit of Williams. their in-game entertainment is fantastic. I yeah. mean, they keep the fans engaged. They feel like they're a part of the the team, the city, the arena. They go. They're willing to spend that money. They get so much bang for their buck. I think the Pacers need to take a page out of these other teams. Yeah, I no mean, kidding. the Warriors may – you know, I look at that. I envy it a little bit because I want to see it at Pacers games other than in the playoffs – even during the regular season, that place is so loud. Their fans are so into the games that you want to see it so bad as an Indiana fan. The only and, time I ever heard it as loud as I've I've heard it is just only at Miami Heat games, and I believe that we are done with those Miami Heat games now. I it agree. is not as big of a threat now that LeBron James has gone, and I'm hoping this year we can make the Cavs one of our arch rivals. I, I, I would like to follow the LeBron and the Pacers. That is something that has – that was hands down my favorite you know, rival, even though he said it wasn't a rival. In my opinion, that was a rival, yeah. and that I will always remember going to those games. Hey, I will too, and, and I agree. So, so maybe the Pacers can take a look at, okay, so these successful home court advantage teams like the Warriors and the Thunder – why not take a page out of their book? They're probably doing something right, marketing with their Good. fans, and let's try and bring that home court advantage back to Indiana and during the regular season. So I'd like to see that happen. It is worth mentioning, though, that the home court win percentage for teams is down in the last three years. It's declined. And maybe a lot of, I kind of think a lot of that has to do with the fans not feeling it's entertaining enough for what they're spending. Yeah, so could it's, be. it's very interesting to think about the marketing situation. Where people Pacers, just suck at home. <laughs> yeah, very true, and you shouldn't because you're supposed to win your home games, but when you don't have that home court advantage with the fans into it, you're not going to have that, and you might lose at home. If okay. it sounds like you just dropped a rock from the second floor of a building, and you no could hear it. So it, it will be interesting. Pacers, take a page out of it because right now you, you've got the pace mates. You've got Boomer. Boomer's awesome. The mascot. Yeah, number one in the NBA in, in mascots. Woo, woo. like to point that out. High octane drum line. They are great at drumming. The power pack. The boom babies. You have mm-hmm. game night greetings. So, and the power pack. They, The thing with that, I feel like it's getting a little overdone. It might be time to switch it up because... As cool as it is to see them jump off those trampolines and do those tricks to dunk, the Pacers have been doing it for a while now. They miss quite a bit, too. And they do. And when you start to miss, 
maybe it's time for something else because all it makes the fans do is just look at it, shake their head and laugh and take a drink of their beer. So it's it's just one of those things where it might be time to switch it up. But I, I will say this, one last thing before the next segment here. What do you think, though? I think the Pacers do a good job engaging with fans with the social media. I think that that is a key nowadays with technology. They do – the, t- the Twitter, the photos, share your photos with us and get on the big screen uh, before the games. They're constantly – they do little promotions of name that song, text it, and and it'll win. And you can win, you know, if you text something, you know, they'll, they'll randomly survey a fan and ask them. And if they get it right and the fans can kind of help them out, they'll get a package of of goods or whatever or a t-shirt i like that and i think the pacers do good about that what do you think yeah and they they also have a thing where um you tweet your picture in and then they end up putting it on the big screen during the game and they display almost all of them so that is something that i think is really cool too and you know that's social media social media right there and it's pretty it's pretty cool it is, it is. They do a good job of social media. I think that's a key going forward. Listen to your fans. So, let's get to this last segment really quick, Rhett. And let's just answer the question. What's your most favorite Pacers team in franchise history and why? I'll let you start. Well, this is going to be you know, probably different from yours, but my favorite Pacers team is the 2013-2014 Indiana Pacers. And that is because I am a big Lance Stevenson fan And I believe that the team last year that they had was incredible. And too bad they they fell apart last year um, at the end of the season. But that is honestly my favorite team um, from the Indiana Pacers. They had heart. They they went out and played every game. Lance Stevenson just brought that energy to them. And not just him, but they, I mean, Paul George, he just had an incredible season. And, you know, I liked every single player on that team until we, you know, traded for Evan Turner. But it was an incredible team, in my opinion. Hey, I value your opinion, Rad. That's interesting. Okay. I I went a little bit different, but not too, too different. It's a close... I say this, Rhett, and I say that the year before that is a close second to me. I almost, I almost could have gone either way with this one. So I'll go ahead and mention both of them. The 2012-2013 Indiana Pacers team was up there for me. Jeff Foster. Jeff Foster. That Love man, him. DJ Augustine, Paul George, Danny Granger, DG33 was one of my favorite Pacers. Gerald Green, Ben Hansbro, I loved him and what he Tyler Hansbro. Yeah, and Tyler Hansbro, both of them. Hibbert Hill, Orlando Johnson, Jan Mahimi, Dominique McGuire, Miles Plumley, Lance Stevenson, David West, and Sam Young. This team was is right there with this other one that I'll mention. I love this team. They were exciting to watch. They were good. Listen to that. Finished forty nine and thirty two, first in the Central. Vogel had done a, such a good job overcoming this third year here with the Pacers, bringing them to the tops in the East. They had great defense, second best in the NBA, and they made it to the Eastern Conference Finals, this notorious series against the Miami Heat where they lost in Game 7 in South Beach. But in the first round, beat the Hawks 4-2. In the semifinals, swept, or not swept, 4-2 against the Knickerbockers, another hated rival, and then Oh, so close. Almost went to the NBA Finals, but lost to the freaking Heat in I seven. I have to agree that probably is my second favorite team. Other, you know, I wasn't a fan of Sam Young, um, but that is that was a great team. 
It was. It was. And that team is right close second. I would say, if not close second, because I had to pick one, I put them second, but it could go either way. My my number one that I had, though, it was the mid-90s team. 94, hmm. 95. Reggie. Reggie Miller. You had both Davises. You had Reggie. You had Mark Jackson. You had Rick Smith. You had Sam Mitchell. This team was boss. I loved yeah. this team. Th- Rhett, any time I had to have one with Reggie on it because you can't go without our favorite player in Pacers there you history. Go. But Reggie Miller and this team was just so successful. Fantastic team. And they picked up Mark Jackson, and it helped out so well. They finally got past the Knicks. It was a beautiful year. They ended up losing to the Magic, though, uh, in the semifinals. But it was still – actually, in the conference finals, lost to the Magic. But the it was a great team. I loved watching them play. They were scrappy. And that is what you love, and that is what you think about when you think Indiana Pacers is scrappiness. And so that is who I'm going with. For yeah. Great team, great for team. My, for my fantastic, one well team. put one. Well, it's a good pick. Hey, you can't go wrong when you're talking Indiana Pacers and great no kidding. teams in the past. Maybe the Pacers will have a new great team this next year that will make some noise. We will see. Hey, see. it will be interesting. We can only hope. That is it for this show, though, and we will have next week. An entertaining show, for sure, with new segments, maybe some debates. It will be good. It will be good stuff. So, to recap what was talked about, we discussed the Pacers' latest offseason news. We talked about the rule changes that should occur and that might occur. We chatted about Indiana's marketing situation at Banker's Life, and we answered the question, What is your most favorite Pacers team in franchise history and why? That is all we have for tonight. Thank you for tuning into our show. Feel free to leave any comments. Tweet and retweet the show at Kyle M. Newman and at Rhett Hensley. We will be back at it next Wednesday at 8 Eastern time. I'm Kyle Newman. And I'm Rhett Hensley. Have a good night. Go Pacers. Go Pacers.